We're going to go ahead and call our third Multimodal Freight Transportation System Improvement Task Force Committee to order. Um, please call the roll. Senator Chambers Armstrong. Here. Senator Higdon. Here. Senator Storm. Here. Senator Turner. Here. Represent Blanton. Represent Freeland. Here. Represent Smith. Here. Represent Tackett Lafferty. Co-chair Howe. Here. Chairwoman Miles. Here. Um, I'd like to start us off today of just to have a moment of silence for Judy Taylor today. We've um, had the celebration of life for her earlier, and um, I'd just like for us to take a moment of silence. Thank you. Um, I will, um, we'll go ahead and approve the minutes from the second meeting. Um, has everyone had a moment to look over that? Do I have a motion to accept the minutes? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? The minutes have passed. We will go ahead and invite our um, first speaker up. He is Miguel Zamora. The third, the Vice President of Louisville Riverport Authority, he's from the foreign, we're going to discuss the foreign trade zone issues. So, welcome. Thank you for being here today. Please identify yourself um, for the record, and then we'll proceed from there. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm Miguel Zamora, the second, actually. Oh, I'm sorry. Not a problem. I saw that this afternoon on the thing, and I thought I'd just mention We've it. We've multiplied you. Yes. <laughs> Um, and I am the vice president of the uh, Louisville Riverport Authority, uh, which uh, is also Foreign Trade Zone 29. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to address you all. Um, I've prepared a, a brief kind of an overview presentation of foreign trade zones, not knowing exactly where your interests lie. I thought it would be best to uh, provide just a top-level overview of the history of the program. Um, as I go through those, I, I'm not going to spend. I'm not going to read the slides and that. But as I go through those, if you have any questions or concerns that you'd like to ask, please feel free to interrupt me, and, and uh, I, I can address those for you. Very well, thank you. Let's see. I think this is it. Oh, wrong. You do that well and you might get a job. You know that, right? <laughs> no danger of that. Get acclimated to, I'll try to get acclimated to this microphone. So the authority was created in 1965 and the uh, Foreign Trade Zone 29 was established in 1977. Uh, I imagine that uh, given the length of time that it takes for those things to happen, that uh, the thought of creating that foreign trade zone was probably present at the formation of the original formation of the, the authority in 1965. Um, 29 is the, we are the 29th foreign trade zone created in the United States. There's now over 300, and, uh, there's 305 last count. Um, foreign trade zones, uh, were uh, established by the Foreign Trade Zone Act in 1934. It was one of uh, two acts. One was the, the other was the Reciprocal Tariff Act that were passed in 1934's legislation to uh, try and uh, help come out of the Great Depression. Uh, they were envisioned as uh, acts to basically reverse some some things that had happened with respect to trade and incentive that had incentivized manufacturing outside of the United States back in that time. Um, it's interesting that there's a lot of similar parallels today um, in a much more complex trade environment, but basically the issues remain the same. Um, so the Foreign Trade Zone Act uh, provides incentives to uh, basically bring manufacturing and other distribution activities back into the United States that had previously had reason to be outside. Um, foreign trade zones, that's the, the 
United States program that is, uh, they're commonly referred to as special economic zones across the world. Um, the very first uh, instance of those were called intrapose. Uh, they existed uh, back in the times before even Alexander the Great to facilitate trade moving uh, along the, the Cape of Africa uh, and South Central Asia. Uh, the trade routes were pretty small and short. So they'd get things from India all the way to uh, Europe using these intrapos. Um, you all have probably heard of special economic zones uh, in China. They use them quite extensively. But in China, different than the United States, each zone has its own rules and the way they're set up. Uh, maquiladoras in, in Mexico are another example of special economic zones similar to for, foreign trade zones. And then there's uh, free trade zones around the world. There are special economic zones that have their own unique rules. And sometimes it's a country-driven uh, program, similar to the, to the federal program here. And others, like China, it's depending upon the actual geographic location of that zone. So a foreign trade zone is a secure area located in or adjacent to a customs and border protection port of entry. Uh, it's legally outside of U.S. Customs territory for duty purposes. So when the zone is designated and activated, that physical location legally is, is outside of, of the United States for trade purposes. Um, so goods in the zone are uh, considered to be part of international, international commerce and those only when the goods leave the zone and enter the commerce of the United States uh, would duties be owed on them. So the key stakeholders for the for the foreign trade zone program uh, starts with the, the act, the federal act passed in 1934. Then you the act created the foreign trade zones board, which is uh, uh, the Department of uh, uh, Treasury and commerce are make up that board that oversee the program and then u.s customs and border protection is the other key com part of that because customs and border protection supervises each zone each geographic zone and then below that you have the grantee who administers the program on behalf of the board uh, in the lo locales like us here in kentucky uh, then operators and users like Toyota Motors or GE Hire or uh, the new AESC plant down in Bowling Green and others, many others. And then the operators can hire people to outsource the administrative tasks. So the board is comprised of uh, uh, the Secretary of Commerce and the Secretary of Treasury. They have appointed undersecretaries to actually uh, take care of all the day-to-day -day, uh, that uh, they're required uh, to deal with. They establish grants, uh, expand uh, existing zones, and maintain uh, the foreign trade zones in all forms. So they interact with customs to make sure that customs uh, knows what the expectations are for the uh, administrations of the zones. But they also because we're in a much more complex situation than we were in 1934 when this was passed, there are lots of other government agencies that have a stake in commerce. Uh, FDA, for example, um, EPA, and, and others, uh, uh, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. So when goods that fall under the jurisdictions of those government agencies are involved, those, those agencies interact with the Foreign Trade Zones Board to determine how those goods are going to be able to move through these zones uh, without, uh, st you know, running afoul of, of the specific regulations that, that might apply. Uh, that has to be coordinated then with Customs and Border Protection. Um, they are on the ground the most important. I mean, everybody's important, but they're the ones without them you don't have a program. The Customs and Border Protection uh, oversees and supervises each zone project. So 
the zone projects have to be geographically adjacent to a port of entry. Uh, those for the for the Commonwealth of Kentucky, those ports of entry include uh, Louisville, Kentucky, which serves uh, central Kentucky and, and uh, southern Indiana. Then you have the port at uh, Erlanger that's called Cincinnati, but it's based in Erlanger, Kentucky, which services northern Kentucky and southern Ohio. You have the port of Henderson, uh, uh, Evansville, which services uh, southern Indiana and uh, western Kentucky, Henderson and, and Owensboro are the boundaries for that port in Kentucky. And then most recently, the port of Nashville, Tennessee, which is providing service to our new zone project in Warren County, Kentucky. Um, the, the other uh, closest adjacent port of entry would be in Charleston, West Virginia, but that is uh, barely adjacent to Ashland, Kentucky. After it, it, it's geographically pretty far away. So those are the ports of entry. Um, zone projects have to be geographically uh, adjacent, either 60 statute miles or a one-hour drive from the outside boundaries of the port. Um, just a basic overview of how goods move through through a uh, into a zone uh, they arrive in the United States now without a zone project at this point where they're arriving in the states that's where the uh, importer has to pay for the duties so with the zone they move into a zone pro into a zone territory no duties are paid and duties would only be paid when they move into the commerce of the United States if they export the goods or if they move them to another zone for further processing they don't pay duties yet. So that's where we get into the benefits. Why do you want it? Why would somebody want a zone project? So the duty savings. They can defer the save the duty payment, which if you're importing a lot of goods, that in, that basically takes a net zero payment terms to US Customs to net thirty or net sixty or net ninety days. However long those goods are sitting in that zone, that's how much longer you've got to pay the duties on that, which can be a significant savings to your cash flow situation. You could eliminate the duties. So if you export the goods or you move them to another zone outside of your responsibility, then you never pay the duties on them. Uh, you can reduce the duties. So Manufacturers uh, will do this, and this was one of the first uses of the zone program, where if I bring in parts, different parts, and create a, a washing machine or a car or whatever, the parts themselves might have a duty tariff that's higher than the tariff on that finished good. Well, when I create that finished good, I get to shift the duty on those higher parts to the lower, to the lower tariff rate, and so I reduce my duties. In some cases, that eliminates the duty payment. If your finished good has zero duties, then you shift all your imports that make the finished good to zero. Uh, our friends in Lexmark, at Lexmark, that's how, how they use the zone. The cartridges have zero duties, so everything they import, they don't end, end up paying any duties on them. Uh, another thing that's uh, become very attractive is if you have a new facility, production equipment that you might have to import to stand that new facility up you don't pay duties on it until you start producing the goods that you're going to use so in the case of a battery manufacturing facility that's some pretty expensive uh, equipment that they're bringing in with a, a high tariff cost but they've deferred the duties on that until they actually start producing uh, their finished goods uh, then there's administrative savings uh, and other taxes that you could that an operator could save on so uses here are economic development uh, site selection and job attraction uh, all those benefits would are attractive to folks that are looking to uh, to bring in something to the area then the operation savings that I just covered you know the tariff shift the inversion um, eliminating or lowering the duties, deferring the cost of the duties, and then th uh, there's operations improvements that can uh, positively impact an operation. Direct delivery, which uh, means that if I'm importing goods into central Kentucky, 
uh, they usually they will physically move through a, typically a port of entry like say Los Angeles or Newark or New York. Um, if they're moving to a foreign trade zone while they physically move through those ports, they don't get detained at those ports. They move directly to the foreign trade zone, which would be my address in say Louisville if that's where the zone's at, which saves uh, can save quite a bit of time and eliminates a lot of headaches for importers. Uh, if you've ever been involved in any of that, you would know that uh, it's not uncommon for a container to get caught at a port someplace because customs needs to take a look at something. Well, if they need to do that for your foreign trade zone, they're going to do it locally. Um, so that, that can be a big benefit uh, to an operator. All right, so Foreign Trade Zone 29, we we have 20 operators uh, in the Commonwealth uh, operating at 27 different sites. Um, we have a 25-county service area. It's an alternate site uh, framework service area. So folks in those 25 counties can apply for a zone project and should – expect that Customs and Border Protection will, will supervise it because they've already given their, their approval to do that. Um, in cases where they're outside of the service areas, like Warren County, we have to work with Customs at a port to get, uh, de to get them to support it, but uh, that can be done as well. So the whole state, this slide shows the whole state's uh, uh, foreign trade zone activity in 2022 um, it was uh, the report makes everything kind of generic so you don't know if it's 10 billion or 25 billion it's closer it's going to be closer to 25 uh, billion because the next year's numbers uh, were a little bit higher than 25 billion so you can expect that that's what that was the imports uh, were 750 to a billion dollars which was up just a little bit over the previous year and then total shipments typically matches your merchandise received obviously uh, employment for the foreign trade zone in the commonwealth was right around between 26 and 27 thousand direct uh, full-time uh, equivalents uh, that was up uh, about a thousand or so over the previous year so the zone program continues to grow here in the commonwealth activity through the zone programs uh, we continue to rank in the top typically top 20 and in some statistics nationwide even in the top 10 um, uh, as a as a state and in zone 29 uh, ranks in the top 25 in several different respects too um, here's some more just general statistics. I've included in the packet that you have uh, some general information that just uh, focuses on Kentucky's performance uh, last year and then some general statistics for the program overall. And there's a link in the packet there to the entire zones report. The, the Foreign Trade Zone Board publishes a report every year that uh, is sent to Congress so Congress can evaluate that the program's actually doing something for uh, for our their constituents. So th this slide shows the blue stars are all the, the designated sites in the Commonwealth uh, that belong to Zone 29. Uh, there are th uh, there's three operators in Zone 47, which is the grantee that has uh, Boone, Kenton, and Campbell counties out of the Erlanger Airport. But I don't know. I'm not familiar with exactly who those are. And the, th the green stars are three uh, applications that are currently pending for designation in front of the uh, Foreign Trade Zones Board. Uh, the two in the center, we have no reason to believe that there's going to be an issue with getting those designated. But this one here in Logan County, currently, we're not sure how that's going to go because we don't have uh, support from Customs to supervise it yet. Uh, the Port of Nashville is unable to do so because they don't have the manpower. Uh, we're in discussions with the port of uh, Evansville Henderson to see if they can perhaps help us with that. Let's see. The blue count the blue counties here are our uh, alternate site framework service area. 
So in these counties, we should be able to make an application for designation to the Foreign Trade Zone Board and uh, expect approval within 30 days. Uh, and that's so far has been the case. Um, this just this shows our 20 operators at, that are in Zone 29. Um, so you can see you have a, a, a wide array of, of interest. You have uh, AESC and Blue Oval are in here. Our uh, two river ports, Henderson and Owensboro, are operators. Uh, for they have zones. Uh, then you've got apparel distributors like Columbia, Guess, Wolverine, uh, and then you have a, a variety of uh, manufacturing interests: Dow, uh, LL Flex, um, Heister Yale, Toyota, um, and then. One I, I want to just point to is Workwell Industries. They're uh, in, in Jefferson County. They're one of the uh, early adopters. And Workwell is a, is a second chance workshop that uh, uh, hires folks that typically would have a hard time getting a job. Um, they're a nonprofit organization as well. Their board of directors uh, cr worked with some larger industry there in Jefferson County to get jobs for these folks that they were trying to service. And one of them is in the, the uh, distilled spirits industry, and they do a lot of packaging and specialized kitting for them. And they use the zone because the goods that flow through there are quite expensive, so the duty rates on those can be quite expensive. So they get a deferral on the duties, and then if they package them into kits, they might get a, a different tariff rate as well. Um, but it shows how the zone could be used to help facilitate uh, operations outside of what we normally think about uh, in terms of, of economic development and just uh, gung-ho, go, let's go get some jobs into the Commonwealth kind of thing. So challenges that we see uh, for the zone program, even in Jefferson County or the area directly surrounding Jefferson County, which is the Port of Louisville, uh, Customs' ability to respond to zone projects in that area is becoming a little bit more challenged because of the, the resources that CBP is requiring them to divert to other places in the United States. So it's not uncommon for these inland ports of entry to have their officers reassigned to the border, usually the southern border, but there's other places as well, in response to a lot of the things that we all have seen on the news and things that are going on, uh, both for immigration purposes and for homeland security issues. It's not just about uh, keeping the border, keeping folks from coming in illegally, but there's other homeland security things that are going on. So. Louisville's being affected by that, and Henderson and Nashville also. And because Henderson and Nashville are, have an even smaller profile than, than Louisville does, it really hampers their ability to do other things and support uh, zone projects outside of uh, what we've already got. So we, we've been already trying to uh, get that message to our congressional delegation uh, and we're going to be uh, working to, to basically focus on that even more and that we basically need more officers assigned to Nashville, um, perhaps Henderson, Evansville, uh, depending on what activity we see. Because right now, just down in, in central Kentucky near Bowling Green, we've got five interested uh, operations that would like to use the zone program. One's already submitted an application and four others that we've been told want to, but we don't have an avenue for them to use the program because we don't have a customs uh, officer that, that uh, can supervise it. Um, so the other challenge that we have as a Commonwealth with respect to the program is the way that the Foreign Trade Zone Board requires that the ad valorem taxes be addressed. So the Foreign Trade Zone Act exempts any operator from any and all local ad valorem taxes, uh, whatever they might be. Um, but before the board will designate a, a, a zone project, 
the operator uh, user has to either get a letter of non-objection from each of the affected tax entities at their location or has to agree to forego uh, taking that uh, taking advantage of that exemption um, each grantee handles that a little bit differently because that creates a contractual obligation between the operator and the grantee if they choose to forego the, the taxes the tax exemption the grantee has to hold them to account for that which is can be a little sticky so um, that's just something for you all to have in mind is 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 a headwind that will face anybody that wants to do this but it's it can be managed and overcome uh, the the other challenge that we see is just a lack of general awareness or understanding about the program so we are working on addressing that little by little uh, our we're doing it in our 25 county service area focused on that uh, and as that improves, then we will reach out more and more to the state. But uh, as things come up across the Commonwealth where we can be of, of assistance, we'll, we're glad to do that. So um, at that point, that's roughly just a very high-level overview of the program, how it works, where it started. And I'll be happy to answer any questions about that, customs, or anything else that you might be concerned about or interested in. Do we have any questions of the committee? Okay, I'll, I'll ask one. Um, how many employees did you say again is involved? Was it 26,000? 26, 26. Sorry, 26,000 to 27,000 direct full time employees. Uh, so directly employed by a zone operator. That doesn't include the uh, residual cast of characters that are employed to support those operations uh, the logistics providers the customs brokers and so forth okay all right any questions all right well you did such a good job they don't have any for you today so thank you for your presentation and um, thank you for the information also you're most welcome thank you very much Next, we have um, Mr. Dan Mann, Executive Director of the Louisville Regional Airport Authority, and Seth Cutter, the Vice President of Public Affairs for the Cincinnati Northern Kentucky International Airport. And so we will invite you all to join us at the table and um, be sure and turn on your microphones and, uh, and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Dan Mann. I'm the Executive Director for Louisville Regional Airport Authority. Um, we have uh, the uh, SDF, the primary airport, the GA airport called Bowman Field, and uh, we also have a business park. Good afternoon. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair. Seth Cutter, Vice President of Public Affairs for CVG Airport up in Northern Kentucky. Glad to be here with you. Thank you all for joining us. All right. First, I want to say thanks for uh, giving us the opportunity to present uh, to the committee today. Um, we love talking about freight and multimodal and how the airport fits with uh, the river port and railroads and highways. It's, uh, it's an exciting time for logistics uh, at Louisville and I'm sure for Cincinnati as well. Okay, so I'll get right into it. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Louisville and uh, some of the explosive growth we've uh, had since uh, the pandemic. I think uh, 2020, um, well, 2019 was a record-setting year for us, and uh, we started uh, 2020 um, also looking really, really good. Uh, January was a record. Uh, February was another record. Um, things kind of slowed down after that, and uh, it, it really, really, really slowed down in March uh, when the pandemic uh, set in. Um, again, we were coming off a record-setting year, um, high hopes for what we were going to do. Um, and then uh, the pandemic starts, and I think we're all scratching our heads saying, hey, how long is this going to last? Memorial Day? Um, I think I thought it was going to be Memorial Day. I, I just picked the wrong year. Um, but it created some opportunities for us, and uh, those opportunities were air service growth, um, capital improvements, um, things that uh, in, in uncertain times when the terminal's empty, 
um, but you have a partner like UPS uh, with Worldport, you know you've got uh, you've got some financial backdrop. And cargo through 2020, 2021, 2022 was setting records. And so we had the finances in place to do capital improvements. Um, we did five times uh, the CapEx in 2020 than we'd done the previous year. So we had we took out we took the uh, uh, position that this this COVID is not going to last forever. We need to be uh, ready for growth uh, that will eventually come, whether it be 22, 23, 24. We knew we had some needs. And so um, air service was one of those. We were uh, aggressively going after Boston service, our largest unserved market at the time. We did not have service to Boston. We could not get service to Boston. Um, but uh, with the COVID, there was no capacity issues in Boston, San Francisco, um, Seattle, all, all those markets we were really had uh, opportunities with. They weren't there, so we aggressively went after those. In the midst of, uh, uh, of very, very little air traffic, uh, we were able to add Breeze, Spirit, Sun Country. Um, we got Boston. We had started with one flight to Boston, went to two flights to Boston. Now we have three flights to Boston. And you can see um, the growth has just been exponential, a 22% increase uh, over 2019's record. Eight uh, airlines, 37 nonstops. If you think back, 2018, we only had 21 nonstops uh, at Louisville. And, uh, you know, coming out of uh, the unknown, investing in our facilities, uh, 37 nonstops now. And we still have a lot of opportunities before. But with this increased traffic, uh, we are seeing some pinches in our infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> uh, some more slides, uh, 2023 estimate, 10% over 2019. Uh, so the records, uh, uh, you know, it's just going to shatter that record. And, and, again, we're seeing checkpoint, TSA checkpoints. If anybody's flown out of Louisville recently, there's some lines in the checkpoint. There's some parking uh, constraints uh, because we have much larger aircraft. Uh, so all those things we are working on, uh, doing advanced planning for and really planning for more growth, at least on the air service front, uh, through 2024. This is our route map. Uh, you see our logo there up in uh, the corner. That's uh, Seattle. That is our next uh, target. Seattle's our our largest unserved market right now. We would love to move that logo and put a dot on the map uh, for Alaska Air Service. And um, we're also working on Toronto service, uh, which um, again looks very promising. As I mentioned. Uh, we uh, we would not have had uh, this growth without our partner UPS, uh, the cargo operator, and so a lot of the things we do we we just focus on how do we make sure UPS is strong at Worldport and continues to grow. Um, Two hundred sixteen million dollar investment, I, and I will say these investments are made by users of the uh, of the airports. So if you use the airport, uh, you fund the service. It's very much like a business model. So we are not uh, collecting state or local tax dollars to to build this infrastructure and 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 really grow the economy for, for the region. Uh, a five-year capital improvement program, this is the next five years, $156 million, and that's all in the airfield to make sure that we are building the infrastructure that UPS needs to continue to grow and thrive. Uh, Taxway Lima, um, I, again, some of this is in, in the weeds, but, uh, again, when we have a constrained footprint. Uh, we have highways on two sides. We've got a railroad on the side and a Ford plant to the south of us. So everything we do at the airport is to make it more efficient uh, within that existing infrastructure. So UPS measures everything they do in minutes. And so if we can get the UPS from the west side to the east side, east side to west side uh, quicker, saving four or five minutes, that's a less fuel burn, that's more efficiency. Um, and that's why we're investing Taxway Lima, Taxway Bravo. Um, we built a Taxway Alpha connector. If anybody's been by Louisville, that massive hangar, it was just a bunch of steel. That hangar is probably everywhere I go. It gets the most attention just because it is so, so large. Um, that's where they're going to turn the wrench, uh, do the maintenance on their 747-8s. One of the largest 747 bases in the world. Um, again, this, these will be high-paying jobs, um, maintenance jobs for, for UPS and what they do. We are also uh, looking uh, to improve our facilities. Um, New jet bridges, uh, moving walkways, escalators, uh, all those things were fully depreciated at our airport. They needed to be replaced. And, uh, again, if you just think uh, one jet bridge is a million dollars, a moving walkway, $1.3 million. And so when you start uh, replacing all those things, you, you get to $50 million before you know it. Um, moving the rental cars, geothermal. This is this is one that really excites me. The, our geothermal is the largest geothermal uh, at any airport in North America. This is 500 wells, 600 feet deep. Um 
it reduces our carbon footprint. But more importantly, this is more importantly for me as it reduces my utility bill by four hundred thousand dollars a year. So it's a it's great for the environment, great for my budget, and the life of my HVAC units um, are, is about uh, double. So about a forty year lifespan. Working on our um, our baggage claim area, all to improve the impression, the first impression of our customers, uh, and make sure that uh, Louisville is a proud gateway that we want it to be. The uh, SDF Next, uh, again, a lot of this is funded uh, primarily by um, UPS and uh, the aviation uh, programs. TSA Checkpoint, again, um, we are really, really, really pressured. That That's a big bottleneck for us. Uh, we have plans now to expand that from five lanes, um, two temporaries and, and the five normal ones to uh, 10 lanes. It's going to be uh, beautiful. It's going to have the best security, uh, remote sensors. It, it's really going to be a nice addition for us. And we think we'll get us through uh, growth over the next uh, 10 years at least. Um, we're working on uh, improving basically all the facilities um, uh, for efficiency. Again, we want it to be a proud gateway. Uh, the last phase will be the terminal exterior. Um, and it's not just pretty. This will seal up the envelope so the, the building's more efficient. But again, it'll just be a gorgeous facility when it's all said and done. I think get back to why we're doing this. Uh, we're growing, um, and we're growing primarily because there's jobs in our community because of logistics, and it, it creates wealth. Uh, it creates a more travel experience, and so we we really think about UPS and what they're doing and what their needs are, really for the next 20 years. UPS, the third busiest cargo airport in North America, fifth uh, largest cargo airport in the world. I think a lot of people do not understand that. Little old Louisville has this much cargo activity to be the fifth busiest in the world. I mean, it's really, really quite impressive. Um, a little bit back to the COVID. Uh, I remember being on a ramp in December, cold December in 2020, when the very first vaccine was delivered on a UPS airplane into Worldport. Since then, 40 billion doses have been delivered to, uh, I think, 50-some different countries. It really changed uh, the trajectory of of economic development for the whole world, frankly. Uh, and again, really neat to see that happen right right here in Louisville. Our business park, um, this business park, it's uh, it was the very first, it made possible by the very first TIF district in Kentucky as a pilot program. We now have six, uh, almost seven million, because um, we just build spec buildings. So it, it added uh, to almost seven million square foot under roof. 3,000 people work down there, 680 acres. Uh, this TIF district um, is coming to the end of its useful life. Uh, December 31st uh, of this year will be 20 years. And, uh, w you know, when we talk to KEDFA, they say it's the most successful TIF district they've had. It has been phenomenal, the, the infrastructure that's been put in place, the jobs that it's produced. And really, this business park supports uh, UPS and all the logistics that they do there. It's, it's, been, it's been a phenomenal experience. The other part of this, uh, lesser known, is the Renaissance Zone spins off some revenue that can be used to do things to grow air service at our airport. We are constrained about where we can spend money. Renaissance Zone um, helps facilitate new air service growth. And again, it's it's been successful because uh, it's supporting UPS and their cargo ops. I say all that to say, um, you know, the commercial air service airports, uh, logistics hubs, cargo drives, the economic impact. It's been um, really key to our region growth for whether it be um, automotive, uh, medical, it, uh, this economic impact driven by the cargo operations, not just us, but Cincinnati um, is driving it throughout the state, $480 million um, in tax revenue generated just at our airport. Um, but when you compare the three big airports, uh, it's, it's, about, it's about jobs and it's about uh, revenue that's produced for the state. Again, we're self-sufficient. So this, uh, because these airports are here, it's more jobs, it's more revenue, and it, uh, it, it continues to paint a very rosy picture for what we're doing mm -hmm. in the future. Um, I think the future's bright. Um, we're gonna keep growing. The infrastructure um, needs are, are great, uh, but I think we have a good plan over the next 10 years to, uh, to build what needs to be built to continue to grow and support our cargo operations. Um, with that, I'll hand it over to Seth. Well, before we move on, I, I know Coach Hale, I think, has a um, question for you. Yeah, thank you. Um, you don't have to go back, but there's the slide where you showed the of the industrial park. 
I noticed there's an elementary school in the middle of that. Can you explain yeah. the, the role or significance? Did that come first and everything else come up around Min it? Or? Minor Lane Elementary School was there when it was, uh, was houses and residential um, at the very beginning of this. So um, that was the only thing that stayed um, as this business park was being developed. We've adopted uh, Miners Lane. Um, this is a, it's a very low income school. I think 50 different languages are spoken at this school. So <coughs> we've adopted that school. We, we uh, buy robots for them, science lab. But Minor Lane is, is the school. It's there. There's a little trailer park on the other side that is where most of the kids go. It's a, it's a unique story. Um, uh, great. It always makes me feel good when we do a ro reading program or buying books or uh, fill their backpacks. We are doing uh, the last project we're doing for the TIF is a minor lane expansion. So there's a lot of activity there. It does impact uh, the school operations. So we're winding that to three lanes. We're repairing the bridge. Uh, unfortunately, we probably will miss a deadline uh, for that. So we're working with GEDFA to see what options we are to finish this very critical minor lane expansion for, for the elementary school, but also Granger and the others. But yeah, that school, that school is there. It's a, it's, it's a really touching story when you go to, to see the, the teachers and kids and fill their backpacks. It's, it's kind of interesting. So that's a, that's a Renaissance zone school and uh, all, all the businesses there kind of treat them like they're, they're our own children. I hope, I hope that answers the question. It's a, uh, it's, it's just a unique piece of yeah. sliver of that property. It kind of is a throwback to what it used to be. Can I one more question, too, of Adam, course. here? Um, for our benefit, you talked about the increased uh, lines to Boston and, and, and this sort of thing. From an air freight standpoint, can you kind of walk us through why that's important for Louisville, Louisville businesses, Louisville residents, residences, uh, businesses and, and residents of the Commonwealth of Kentucky to have expanded out uh, uh, passenger lines that also bring that freight in? Can you kind of walk us through some of that? Not yeah. to put you on the spot too much. But oh, no, not at all. Anything so, you say is going to be more than some of us know. Yeah, w one of the things that we talked about uh, when I got here in 2018 was um, air service you have to have good air service if you're going to grow business. If you're going to grow your business in Louisville or if you want to expand business or increase businesses, you have to have air service to places where people want to go. Boston, from the medical supply in particular, was our largest uncertain market at the time, um, and it was constraining growth. Um, it was constraining future growth, new business coming, but also businesses that were here. How are they going to get to Boston to uh, take care of business? And so this air service piece of it is vital. You had the cargo operation that whatever you wanted to do, you could put it on a UPS plane or other providers and, and get that cargo. But this air service piece of it was constraining growth. And so Boston, that Boston service was vital. Uh, other markets, too. I mean, we talk about the ultra low cost carriers. I say, what does that have to do with business uh, growth? Um, you have to have the ultra low cost carriers because it forces competition with the main line. So because we have Spear and Breeze and more Allegiant flights, we now have Southwest uh, flying more frequency to more destinations, American added larger aircraft. Most of our routes now have uh, have mainline service with first, first class cabins. All that means lower airfares, better options to grow business. The other part is we have a lot of remote workers. Um, remote workers need to fly places. And so we are seeing people now that are moving to Louisville for all the right reasons, affordability, but they can have air service now to go back to the, whatever their main area was. Maybe it's on the, the West Coast. Uh, so that air service is critical. The logistics, the cargo um, makes it so those businesses that relocate can do it cheaper, better, quicker, faster. So all the things that, that you're looking at as a region, it's like, what do we need to be uh, compete with other cities, and we are we are closing that gap. So this air service is is really really critical, and it's also a benchmark to the health of of the economy in Louisville and what we're trying to do. Co-chair, I had kind of a follow up on that. I know a lot of airports benefit from the the belly freight aspect of their uh, commuter lines. Is that kind of benefit somewhat negated in Louisville because of the heavy UPS presence there? Or, or was there an added benefit? Um, you mentioned Boston and the medical, like having Boston Scientific or something being able to ship things down to Norton. Or is there any synergy that like that that we gain from having a line to Boston or some of these other places? Or does the impact of UPS kind of wash that out for Louisville? Uh, no, not at all. I mean, uh, the competition between the belly cargo and uh, UPS, they, they really, they work together. Our biggest constraint was the fact that we didn't have enough mainline to carry the belly cargo. Now that uh, we've transitioned to basically all mainline service, we're starting to see the belly cargo pick up as well. Um, although cargo, 
this last uh, six months has been a little bit soft. The belly cargo is going great because we have more options uh, to carry that on on larger uh, larger equipment. So they work very well together. We are not. Uh, we don't look at it as uh, competition where if one's doing great, the other one isn't. They they really kind of grow together. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Mr. Cutter, the Thank floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair. And I will try to fly through these slides. We haven't belabored you with airport puns, but we <laughs> use them quite often. Um, no, is I just want to hit on one thing that Dan mentioned uh, that I think is worth repeating uh, in terms of the economic impacts of our airports, because this is beyond just commercial airports in general, aviation airports, this applies to too, but you really, uh, we're really viewing our airports as hubs for mobility, right? Moving people and goods, centers for job growth and development, as Dan said, that really are self-sustaining tax uh, base uh, increasers, job growth generators. We don't uh, really have any source of state revenue. We do all of what we do, as Dan mentioned, through our own funds and then leverage some of the federal programs that are available to airports. So um, we will obviously continue in that mission and, and we lead, Dan ended, I lead with what is most important, which is the job creation element of what we do. Um, for those who are unfamiliar with CVG, uh, we're, uh, we're up in northern Kentucky in Boone County, Kentucky. Uh, as Dan mentioned, uh, things have really improved coming out of the pandemic. I won't belabor the points on this slide, but it's kind of the summation for you that we are the seventh largest cargo airport in North America, not nearly where uh, Louisville Muhammad Ali International is, but we're, we're trying to get there. Um, and certainly are proud of the, the community of jobs that we support, 16,000 folks working on campus. And uh, as Dan mentioned, that creates uh, such an economic impact on our community, Southwest Ohio, Northern Kentucky, Southeast Indiana as well. And we're looking to update that figure very soon. On the passenger front, I think this chart, don't don't try to uh, labor your eyes to read each number. The trend is what you can see. It, it really shows what has been the experience of every commercial airport in this country. Uh, Lexington's would look very similar to ours and Louisville's, where you saw we were uh, really impacted by the pandemic in terms of passenger numbers uh, there at the low point in April of 2020 to what we have seen today, which is really strong uh, uh, rebounded growth on the passenger side. And as Dan mentioned, this is our spider map uh, at CVG. And you can see um, that that things have really rebounded coming out of the pandemic. That last chart, this air service, as Dan mentioned, uh, we've welcomed uh, Breeze as well up in, uh, in northern Kentucky uh, with their service um, and added some other airlines to the likes of Alaska with service to Seattle. Sorry, Dan. Um, <laughs> and Sun Country as well during the pandemic um, to where uh, we're primarily serving a local population. Uh, many of you may recall times in CVG's past where we were mainly a connecting airport on the passenger front. And that, that trend, those 7.6 million passengers we served last year, are primarily our friends and neighbors, our businesses, and folks coming to the region and to Kentucky to visit uh, because we now primarily serve that local population. And of course, we're very proud uh, this summer that we welcomed uh, British Airways, the new uh, service five times a week uh, to London and Heathrow. So obviously, uh, we're very proud of that. We're proud of that for the Commonwealth. Um, and Senator Howe, as you mentioned, uh, as Dan was describing, uh, most of our service, like at Louisville, is now on the mainline aircraft as opposed to there are some regional jets in the mix. But that belly cargo, uh, that belly freight really does complement and it helps the air service profile for our airports um, to complement, uh, as Dan described at Louisville, what is really the story of our success uh, in recent years and growth, which is air cargo. So nothing, nothing to the likes of UPS and what Louisville uh, has seen, but you can just see where this has been exponential growth over these last several years since 2015, you know, almost 150% growth in the volume, the cargo volume that we've handled. And a lot of that, you know, of course, is anchored uh, by our friends at DHL. You know, they've had their um, global super hub for the Americas at CVG uh, since the, uh, they've made these investments since 2009, right, which primarily serves their um, – what, a, what is a really global network for them, right? Most of their footprint is not in the United States, but we're that key piece uh, for the Americas region, North, Central, and South. 
And then, um, so that longstanding presence has been great. And now you add in the billion and a half that Amazon Air has invested, which literally you can see it kind of there in the, the middle of the screen of this aerial right across the street from DHL on our campus, right? So we have this burgeoning cargo presence uh, which has spurred other activity that is really the crux of what I wanted to share with you. Uh, because all of this activity, including at Louisville, the increased passenger air service that Lexington has had, all of this is going to bear goodness that I think you all as legislators need to be aware of and, and help us to uh, accelerate growth, right? This is an example. Theme Aero is a company out of Florida that is in the process. This is one of their hangars that, as you can see, as Dan was describing the hangar down at Louisville, this hangar that they uh, opened right before the pandemic accommodates 1747 for maintenance activities there at CVG. And right across the way, you can see it in the upper right-hand corner, they're working on their second hangar, right? Double the investment. They're going to double the job growth. And as, as our uh, colleagues in Louisville well know, the more cargo, the more uh, passenger air service you have, but particularly our strength in cargo as a state, is really begetting more job growth in the way of aviation maintenance, right? So the FAA has a program, uh, which really leads to well-paying jobs for our friends and neighbors. And the more aircraft activity that we're bringing here to Kentucky, the more that sector of jobs will continue to grow. Um, our friends at Kentuckians for Better Transportation, of which Louisville and, and CVG are proud members, um, would, would Jennifer would slap me on the hand if I didn't talk about roads. Um, yeah. But kind of like Dan, we're not as constrained at CVG as Louisville by the highway infrastructure. Obviously, you can see there that I-275 and the 7175 corridor really kind of uh, give us a little space. There's some devel existing development around there, uh, but we've got some room to grow. Uh, and you can see from a roadway infrastructure, it's wonderful uh, to talk to the multimodal task force about these issues, that really because of the growth of Amazon, which is not really reflected in this aerial, but DHL and our front of the house, which is the passenger uh, facilities, have really created, as we've come out of the pandemic and things are getting better, e-commerce continues to grow and cargo is really picking up going into next year, uh, that roadway impacts for both employees and um, you know folks using our front door at the terminal facilities are really constrained, right? So we've enjoyed those strong working relationships with KYTC and with uh, many members of the General Assembly to prioritize and our local leaders to prioritize these projects. What's interesting is you see there's some other projects that I want to now segue to that we have envisioned on the airport campus that are really in need uh, and are ways that we're working with our local and state officials to serve the utility and infrastructure needs to these new developments, right? So we've got some areas of undeveloped land. This is one example where we envision even more hangars, right? More maintenance hangars, more, you know, avionics shops that can create these good paying jobs, complement what's going on on the cargo and passenger side, uh, but are, you know, currently, you know, no utilities, no roadway infrastructure. They're things that we're going to work on leveraging funds for airfield development where we look to the state and the local uh, folks to help us with identifying those pots of funds for, uh, you know, land side development. And the other example of this, um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with CVG, this is kind of this is a rendering, but looking north at the Ohio River, our passenger facilities are kind of outlined there, but we've recently leveraged some of our bipartisan infrastructure law dollars to rehab our apron spaces to accommodate more aircraft parking, as Dan was mentioning. And now we're uh, hopefully working on some deals to bring some land side facilities that can add, as Dan mentioned, uh, UPS anchors the growth at Louisville, DHL and Amazon at our place. But we know that there's interest in this part of the country for more cargo growth because we have the capacity, we just need to start figuring out the ways, and our teams are working on these projects to try to grow the footprint uh, to serve even more users, right? The airports provide the infrastructure, the users do the heavy lifting and the day-to-day -day logistics and moving people as well. So just to kind of wrap up here, uh, in terms of the other modes that we're playing with um, or involved with, I should say, you know, beyond the airport, we don't have uh, necessarily tools like Louisville's Renaissance Zone, uh, but we are becoming more active with development beyond our airport. The previous presentation was very fitting. We've just become the contract 
uh, manager for the grantee of foreign trade zones 46 and 47, so both Cincinnati, Ohio's trade zone and northern Kentucky's. So that's a new space that we're playing in. But as was made evident by the last presentation, airports worked very closely with Customs and Border Protection, so there was a natural tie-in there. Um, we're really doubled down. I think you've had or will have presentations on advanced air mobility or AAM. Um, this is a space where we're really leaning in because users like DHL on Amazon uh, and the airlines, the passenger airlines are talking about how new technology will create different infrastructure demands, right? Do we have the energy resources we need on our airports to serve very high intensity users of energy like these, uh, you know, advanced air mobility craft will require in the next several years? Um, I know many of you are familiar, we've talked about sustainable aviation fuel, the infrastructure that's used to transport fuels in general, but also SAF, they're, they're one in the same. And we, uh, we obviously care about the pipelines and the inland waterways uh, to transport fuels from folks uh, like down in Catlisburg up to the terminals at CVG and in Louisville to serve all of this growth from a jet fuel perspective. And then, of course, um, we're very supportive of and interested in this conversation, I think, that you are having around AVs, right, autonomous and connected vehicles. Uh, I don't know if many of you know, but we, our innovation team works with a lot of local startups. We partnered with a startup a few years ago uh, that uh, pioneered a technology that could retrofit tugs, so the tugs that push aircraft to and from, uh, well, really past the gate, uh, area of concourses, we developed uh, the technology with them, kind of played matchmaker, and really tried to adopt a frame, a regulatory framework to allowing these autonomous type vehicles on the airfield. Now the next question is, are there some good use cases around the airport that could, um, that could help uh, demonstrate to the general public that this technology has some successful uses that we could work together to uh, pioneer. And then because Jennifer would hate me if I didn't mention, but um, I didn't have it represented here, but we are also very close with our friends in transit. Uh, Tank is the operator up in northern Kentucky, and we actually just on my way down, got news that some of the infrastructure that we were laying in the road work to help uh, pedestrian crossing between DHL and Amazon uh, was completed and Tank has expanded their service offerings and has just seen ridership to primarily uh, the cargo uh, hub facilities grow and expand. Uh, so we know that, uh, hopefully this is demonstrated, we know that airports are hubs of all these modes of transit and we're trying to make the infrastructure improvements and of course look forward to working with all of you to see where can targeted and strategic investment really accelerate continued growth uh, for the state and for the folks we serve. So glad to take any questions. I know both of you all said that, I mean, basically both of you all are in the top 10 in the nation on, on freight, transporting freight from the airports. So how do you measure that? I mean, is that a tonnage? Is that, how do you, how do you all get in those categories, your ratings? How's that measured? Um, no, thank you for the question, um, Madam Chair. Um, so w the airport, uh, relies on the users of the airport who are transporting freight to self-report and of course to us the airport and they also do so to the FAA but the numbers we presented today are based on cargo tonnage uh, so total throughput we break that down by month and then of course come up with the yearly averages and then um, one of our trade groups that works globally comes up with those rankings so Louisville is number five globally uh, we're very proud now to be number 14 so not quite where Louisville is but in uh, your question made me remember a great point that it shouldn't be lost to anybody in this room or watching or in our state that it is very uncommon for any state to have one very large cargo hub. The fact that we have three and are growing really speak to the strategic geographic location and then the other investments, frankly, that you all have made and that we have worked together on uh, both in highways to transport goods from air freight to roadway infrastructure, and then, of course, leveraging uh, the river, the Ohio River primarily as well for movement of goods. 
Yeah, one of the things that so it's the it's the tonnage of weight, but from us from our perspective, we actually build the the airlines and the car operators by the the size of the aircraft and how many aircraft they have, and so it's the landed weight of the aircraft that really drives. Um, our ability to keep our landing fees quite low, very competitive for air service development. One of the other things about Riverport, tying that in, um, we have a pipeline from the river out to UPS. Um, that's how they have reliable fuel. So when uh, you know you get bad weather, fuel truck can't get there, they've got the pipeline, which allows them to be a really, really competitive and reliable source of their jet fuel. So um, that, that cargo piece of it is uh, it, it, it's measured, but it, uh, the ramifications of it from the tonnage is a great bragging point, but it really is all the aircraft activity that um, that generates. And then, uh, as Seth had mentioned, the infrastructure around it. So when you when you're bringing thirty thousand people in to facility, that's that's the roads, the highways. Um, that that is really kind of the pinch point. That's a little bit out of our out of our ability to correct. Um, but those things are really really watched closely by our cargo operators. Any other questions, Representative Smith? Yeah, first of all, I want to thank both of you for what you do for the state of Kentucky with your infrastructure and the, I'm sure there's quite a few headaches goes along with uh, what all you've described to us today. Um, I think one of the things that, that I've been looking at, and I, I know I've met with Mr. Cutter, is trying to figure out maybe this distribution chain and uh, the availability to our infrastructure bill that was passed in Washington that has money for supply chain issues. Um, I'd just like to encourage you to, and I know Mr. Cutter knows where I'm going with it, to look at the East uh, for any outsourcing that you may have in the future. Uh, I probably just hear rumors, but I hear maybe uh, difficulty in finding enough employees for UPS, for Amazon. That's the reason that we reached out from to the Northern Kentucky Airport to see if that was true, to see if maybe one of our airports in the east could be uh, utilized in some way. So I'd just like to encourage you to maybe look at that and keep it in the back of your mind where we we have airports, we have infrastructure sitting there that I believe could be used for the smaller, uh, I call them crumbs of the, of the cake, but you know where I'm going with it. Uh, there may be an outsource for you and for you to keep us in consideration. I, I know you mentioned the... Uh, uh, duties that uh, we, we talked earlier about the uh, customs offices um, that was another area that interests me is um, through the supply chain if that having additional customs offices in maybe our ports uh, to utilize uh, that could free up the uh, clearance and we're looking into that we've got the federal side looking into it um, we're also uh, looking at the uh, freight on the rail side to see if uh, we have connectors. Uh, we're fortunate to have rail coming from all different directions in Kentucky. So we're actually a hub, if we look at it that way, for transport. And um, so all those things, I think, is some of the things that, that I wanted to see maybe accomplished in this task force was how can we utilize all the different areas of the state uh, to, to show that we can be maybe a solution for the supply chain issue. Uh, we've seen the horror stories coming from the ports, uh, eight to 12 month backup on supplies. You've heard, of, you, I know you watch the news the same way. I, are we gonna have Christmas or not without toys? I mean, that was two years ago. Uh, there was actually a, a lot of issues going on. And I think there's, I think Kentucky can be a part of the remedy if we all work together. And I know you're overloaded. You've got a humongous task in, uh, that you're handling every day. Uh, just keep in mind that 
we may have some solutions in other parts of the state that could be an asset to you. Uh, utilizing some of these airports that have already we've already put infrastructure in the Big Sandy, the Pikeville. Uh, those are uh, there's a lot of acreage there, and a lot of uh, I th and I I think I'm saying the right things, and I hope that I am. I'm I'm trying to see if there is a way of figuring out how we can be a part of of everything that you've got going on. And just a small part, I think, would make a big influx into eastern Kentucky on just a small part of it. So, again, I appreciate your time. Thank you for what you do, and thank you for what you do for Kentucky. And, and uh, Cutter, I, I really appreciate all the time you've given us in our site visits and, and, and the insight, and mostly your leader there. I can't think of her name right off the bat, but she was uh, very impressive. Uh, she's done a great job there. And uh, you have too. You've turned, you actually turned a place around that a lot of people give up on, and now it's flourishing, it's growing, and uh, we just want to be a part, a small part of it if we can. So, well, Candace is a rock star. Yeah, I was gonna, so <laughs> Candace is, I'm sorry, I'm like the fill in for Candace McGraw, our CEO, who works very closely with Dan and Eric Frankel, our, our counterpart in Lexington. Um, so, thank you, Representative, and we appreciate the time and interest not only of this task force but members you know the one thing we discussed i think bears repeating to everyone is as much as we're lucky to have these three cargo hubs in particular as i mentioned it's very abnormal right ups dhl amazon have made billions of dollars of investment in our state and kind of selfishly for the commonwealth we want to keep doing things uh, that they need us to do, like workforce development. That's why we're involved in these issues, to make it unlikely and harder for them to leave. Um, it's probably unlikely that they'll replicate any of those large-scale facilities uh, in other places. But as we discussed, and I think for you all to think about, our GA, general aviation airports, larger ones like Big Sandy, I think have a really important role to play in terms of what's coming with this advanced air mobility uh, stuff, right? Because if you can start moving packages and people uh, more seamlessly amongst, you know, disparate geographies, like in Eastern Kentucky, where it's it's quicker to fly than to drive some places, right? There's a lot of thinking and planning we can do together to figure out how will all parts of our state benefit from that. Ohio is the really good example of this I think I shared with you. ODOT, KYTC's counterpart in Ohio, has leaned into this technology area and created what's called Fly Ohio, where they're, trying, they're competing for federal dollars and they're winning them. And at Springfield's airport in Ohio, which is near Dayton, so it's not a commercial airport, uh, but the Air Force is involved up there as well. Their pilot, it's the national pilot airport for a lot of this stuff. And now the manufacturers, the OEMs are really in looking at and are investing in those places. So there's a lot of work that Kentucky can and that we will do together to, to bring some of this to reality. Representative Tackett Lafferty. Thank you. Um, I want to thank you for your um, presentation today. I'd like to add to what Representative Smith um, said. A few years ago, our Transportation Committee actually met at CVG. Um, and during that committee, we, we sort of asked, you know, why, why did you choose this location? And, and one of the primary answers was good roads and good water and workforce. And um, I just wanted to encourage you that recently, in support of what uh, Tom said earlier, um, we've made a lot of investments in eastern Kentucky recently in their water and in better roads. Um, just the Mountain Parkway alone, I was speaking with someone earlier, you know, it, it's the construction's still ongoing. Um, but my drive from eastern Kentucky has been cut down nearly an hour already with what with with the construction that's been completed and, and there's still more on the way um you know and like i said we've we've been making major water investments we not too long ago we reopened a state state uh, grade job a state grade facility um in corrections in my district for that position for that facility which offered 
maybe 100, 110 jobs. We had over 1,000 job applications. We have out-of-work coal miners who are skilled in safety, mechanics, all the things that, uh, you know, th that are helpful in these multimodal freight jobs. Um, and, and ultimately, um, today, after, after those applications, that facility is employing steadily about 250 people. So, you know, I think that if you look to the east, um, as, as uh, Representative Smith said, you will see that we are making major improvements in water in roadways and that we also have the workforce available. Um, so uh, anytime you'd like to visit, we'd like to offer you an invitation. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Any other questions from the committee? Now I feel like I need to do a commercial for Owensboro Airport. We've got a great runway. We've already got water. We've already got roads. We're we're in rock and shape, ready and to go. And commercial air service. We do have of commercial. The Allegiant flights now down there. So so very good. You are more than welcome our way. Also, um, thank you both very much for your presentations today. Next, we have um, Mr. William Downey with the Kentucky Railroad Association. If you're bringing any guest with you. That is more than fine. That is more than fine. And I think back earlier you had one of your sidekicks back there. Gay Dwyer was with you too. So we're always glad to have Gay. She sat behind the pole. I think she was afraid I might call on her. <laughs> <laughs> so if you all will introduce yourself and proceed. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. I'm Derek Sublet. I'm the Assistant Vice President for Government Relations for Norfolk Southern Railway and his special guest. Happy to be here. Thanks. Uh, I will handle all the softball related questions. Any difficult questions will be directed to Derek. Um, but I'm William Downey. I'm with RJ Corman Railroad Group, uh, also representing uh, the Kentucky Rail Association today. Uh, Madam Co-Chair, members of the committee, we appreciate your time uh, to talk about the role the rail industry plays in the multimodal uh, transportation network here in Kentucky. Um, so we're going to touch on a couple items today. Uh, we're going to talk about some uh, programs that we're developing for the legislature's consideration, uh, touch on the overall rail network here in Kentucky, some of the investments uh, that are being made here in Kentucky by the railroads, and then what other states are doing uh, to support the rail industry um, in the various states that, uh, that we operate. So the rail network here in Kentucky is comprised of both class one and short line railroads. Uh, the primary class one carriers being Norfolk Southern and CSX, and then uh, your short lines and regionals being RJ Corman and Paducah and Louisville. And when I say that, a class one railroad is, if you think interstate travel, I-65, I-74, uh, long haul, large amounts of freight going long distances. Your short lines and regionals are, think your county roads, city streets, uh, in the case of Paducah and Louisville, even the Western Kentucky Parkway, uh, typically have a point A, a and B uh, d beginning and ending destination, oftentimes the first and last mile of rail traffic. And what I mean by that is we will be the first touch for a customer who's shipping out their product. So we will take those cars along our railroads and develop a, a train. And then we will take that to a designated interchange point for our class one partners to pick up. And then they will then transport to the larger transportation network. And on the flip side, we will receive uh, commodities or raw material from our class one partners and then deliver those <laughs> that last mile to the businesses and industries uh, that utilize uh, our service. So some programs that we're working on here, and we'll touch on this uh, at, at the end as well, uh, but just some items that we don't have here in Kentucky um, as it relates to, to uh, funding programs uh, would be an example of the Kentucky Freight Rail and Safety Improvement Program, a way for, uh, for us to invest in not only preservation and maintenance of some of these railroads that are the only piece of logistical infrastructure in some of these communities, but also expansion and industrial access, ways to attract new businesses that, that land on our rail lines. And then uh, another example would be some type of federal freight fund that uh, not only rail but other modes that you that move freight across our Commonwealth could access 
when it comes to applying for those federal grants that we could use to leverage to bring those federal dollars back to Kentucky and invest in in our multimodal network. Um, and then just as, as an update, we are currently working as an industry with HDR on a rail needs assessment study, similar to what the, the river ports have done uh, over the last year. We hope to have that report done in 2024. So a, a couple ways that rail is truly multimodal and, and ways that we move not just along our railroads, but that we partner, even though we compete with the trucking industry, we partner with the trucking industry. And one of those ways is what we refer to as transloading. We have multiple transloading facilities across Kentucky, and that is literally the transfer of a load from a rail to truck. So as an example of that, in our downtown Lexington yard, we have a customer who ships via, Nor via Norfolk Southern and CSX. They bring in their, their plastic products into the yard in Lexington. We transfer those products via conveyor to a truck. The truck then takes that product the last 20 miles all the way to Frankfurt to the facility to be processed uh, actually for materials used in the, in the auto industry. So just because you aren't directly located on a railroad does not mean you cannot access the economics of freight movement that the railroad industry provides. This is a growing segment of the rail industry's business. Um, and, and this specific move, we are actually developing a new transload yard in Frankfurt that will, instead of having those trucks travel from Lexington to Frankfurt, the rail cars will stay on the railroad all the way to Frankfurt, and then they will only be trucked the last two tenths of a mile versus 20 plus miles, removing uh, several thousand trucks from our roadways between Lexington and Frankfurt. Um, and I'm going to let Derek touch on a, a key piece of the rail intermodal business. Yeah, William, thanks. I mean, you pointed out a really interesting point there is that there's a, a misunderstanding sometimes that I think that trucks and rail compete on our direct competitors, and they are to a certain extent, but Rail intermodal is really the, the growth game for, for railroads, especially for class ones. And we've all seen it. And there's a there's a picture here that depicts it, the the double stack containers. So, you know, some of our biggest customers are actually the trucking industry. So JB Hunt is a huge customer. UPS is a huge customer. Um, and they rely on our service. And so, you know, uh, Representative Tackett Lafferty mentioned it earlier, you know, for for much of Norfolk Southern's history, you know, we picked up coal at the ra or at the uh, the coal mine and ran it downhill to the port in, in Virginia. And, and that was great business for, for a long time. But as we've tr transitioned over to, to different kinds of fuel stocks, excuse me, forgot to silence that, um, you know, the railroad industry has had to reinvent itself. And one of the ways that we've done this is through uh, the growth of our intermodal network. And Norfolk Southern is very proud of its intermodal network. Um, we do have two intermodal facilities here in the, the great state of Kentucky. Um, one, a small one in Georgetown, and then our, our biggest one in Appliance Park. But it is our biggest growth industry, and um, we're certainly looking to grow it here and throughout our 22-state network. Thank you, Derek. Uh, and so just uh, information on carload data as it relates uh, to, to the freight we move here in Kentucky. So you see over 366,000 uh, carloads originated in Kentucky in 2021. And so what that means is that's over a million trucks that are being moved via our railroads across the state and are not traveling on our congested highways, creating wear and tear and, and also emissions um, in the environment. So we play a key role in, in the movement of freights uh, here. And just so you all are aware, that is a, a roughly three to one ratio between trucks to the amount of freight that we can haul uh, per carload on our network. So some investment here in Kentucky, as, as an industry, the rail industry typically invests roughly 25% of our total revenues each year back into our network. That's our, our rail, ties, ballast, our fleets. Those are constantly invested to maintain the network that we operate to serve industries all across Kentucky. Annually in Kentucky, the railroads, primarily our, our class one partners, but also our short lines, invest in excess of $160 million back into our own infrastructure, um, including maintenance, rehab, but also capital expenditures uh, each and every year. So a couple examples of some public and private investments that are being made here recently in Kentucky. 
our friends in Western Kentucky, the Paducah and Louisville Railway recently secured over $29 million from the Federal Rail Administration through the USDOT through a grant called CRISI, the Consolidated Rail Infrastructure and Safety Improvement Grant. They put up 53% uh, or over $31 million and were matched by the FRA, uh, $29 million. So a project in excess of $60 million is being brought back here to Kentucky to improve and invest in the Paducah and Louisville Railway, which moves over 120,000 carloads each and every year uh, from Paducah to Louisville. Another award that was recently made that I'd like to bring up, um, it was actually impacting Chairman Howell's district. Uh, the Tinkin Railroad is a small short line that is primarily uh, roughly 50 miles and about 10 to 12 of that actually comes into Kentucky all the way down to the Hickman Port. They were awarded $7.3 million uh, but, oh, on a 70% grant from the FRA. Between the state of Tennessee, Tennessee DOT, and the Tinkin Railroad, they matched the additional 30%. Unfortunately, Kentucky did not participate in that grant, so the majority of those funds that were awarded are now being actually invested in the state of Tennessee. Um, they're still investing some in that line. Uh, they actually have a, a customer, uh, I believe, Tokai Carbon, that receives shipments that can only be shipped via rail. So they have business and they have the opportunity to go to the river port there in Hickman, but because the state of Tennessee partnered with them on that grant, the majority of those funds, unfortunately, are being spent in the state of Tennessee. So here in Kentucky, we are able to take advantage of the KRCI program or the Rail Crossing Improvement Program. And that's approximately $1.6 million annually. Um, the, the downside to that, and we, we appreciate uh, the funding each and every year, but they are limited to public at grade crossings um, to, to repair and improve the, uh, the crossings that are typically, unfortunately, the damage caused by those are, are really by the traveling public, but we partner with the cabinet each and every year and are grateful to take advantage of those funds. This last year, we did set aside some portion of that to partner with HDR, as I mentioned, for the rail needs study that is currently underway. So Derek's going to touch on this. Uh, a couple states that we like to highlight. We have several bordering states, Ohio, Tennessee, Indiana, Virginia, along with North Carolina and Pennsylvania, are really state leaders in the type of funding programs that make significant investment into the freight, freight rail networks. And Derek's going to touch on uh, what Indiana has been doing for the last several years. Yeah, and right off, I apologize. I'm a Hoosier by birth, so <laughs> I appreciate just sitting at this table. And your committee rooms are much nicer than ours in the Hoosier state. So, again, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, Alabama also does a nice job, and they weren't on that program, but uh, or on that slide, previous slide. But as William mentioned, I mean, railroading is an extremely capital-intensive industry. Just to give you a, kind of a kind of an example, um, we're a timber railroad or a, a timber tie railroad, so twenty thousand miles in twenty-two states, and each tie is about one hundred and fifty dollars a piece. So you can imagine how much it costs to maintain Norfolk Southern's footprint in its in its network. So. What Indiana saw and what Indiana realized is that, and Indiana has, um, is fortunate enough to have 42 short-line railroads in its state, um, is that the, as William indicated earlier, the short lines are the first and last mile for, and really connect in many ways the customers with the class ones, but they were struggling to keep up with just with maintenance. So Indiana instituted the Industrial Rail Service Fund a number of years ago. As you can see on the slide, it, it, um, it's a, a continuing allocation. It, um, the the uh, fund is funded through a, a pr small percentage of the sales tax. Um, the only entities that are eligible for application are short line and regional railroads. And in some cases, um, it's also used as gap funding for a potential industrial customer. Um, they need, you know, a half million dollar switch to go into a plant. They can work with the short line railroad to apply for that and um, can, can prove successful and get a grant for that sort of thing. But, I mean, I think what we're looking for in Kentucky, or at least the short line operators are looking for, is maybe a, a potential for, for discussion on something like this. Again, Indiana does it. We see other states that do it, Ohio, Alabama. Um, Kansas is really good with it. Um, but it is a, 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 an extremely capital-intensive industry that is, that is difficult to maintain. Um, did you want me to touch on the local sure, tracks? Yeah. So, uh, and sorry, we, we put this together like last minute, so I apologize <laughs> for the flow of this. But um, so in addition to uh, the Industrial Rail Service Fund, uh, Indiana, in its 2017 highway um, tax, uh, we, we raised the gas tax up there. 
um, they created what's what we call affectionately call the local tracks overpass program. Uh, Indiana is fortunate enough to have a lot of railroads, but we're also fortunate fortunate enough to have um, more public crossings per track mile than any other state in the nation. And so if you've ever been stuck uh, at a railroad crossing, you know how frustrating that is. And so what what the railroads did, we partnered with local governments, county and city governments, as well as the state to create this program, which was um, funded out of some excess bonding capacity that the state had. And so we created a fund which allocated roughly $150 million of state money and then a 20% match from, from railroads and local governments so that we could, one, eliminate grade crossings because Indiana is always top five for grade crossing incidents, so that's a problem. But two, um, to consolidate these and then use that fund to build literally overpasses over our railroads in Indiana so that we improve safety and mobility. And so this, this program has been, we're very proud of it uh, in Indiana. It's been exported to other states in the Midwest. Michigan now has a similar program. Illinois has a similar program, and I'd like to think that the federal government's new railroad crossing elimination program that's funded at the federal level um, mimics Indiana's program, but it's been very successful, and we're looking to export this program to other states on our network as well. Thank you, Derek. Um, And and just a couple other states to highlight again. I mentioned Tennessee. So as an example, a couple years ago, the state of Tennessee made a $85 million allocation for the preservation and maintenance of short line railroads across the state. And that's divvied up over a four year period. So roughly $20 million a year are utilized by the various short lines across the state and the communities that they operate in. Uh, the state saw and sees significant value in preserving and maintaining that infrastructure for a lot of rural parts of the state, that that is the only piece of logistical infrastructure that is available for those businesses and industries, not only for current customers, but also for the ability to potentially recruit new business, having that piece of rail infrastructure is critical to those communities as an asset when it comes to transportation and the movement of freight. So uh, Pennsylvania, on average, uh, awards roughly $30 million a year, and then the state of North Carolina, roughly 20 to $21 million a year. All of these programs are some type of matching program that bring private investment and public investment to the table uh, and allows the continual investment and strength and growth of the freight network in each of those states. So I I touched on this at the beginning. Again, this is we are developing a a few type of programs for the legislators consideration. Uh, We just feel that especially given the recent passage of the infrastructure law and the amount of dollars that are available at the federal level, that we're missing an opportunity to go after some of those freight dollars uh, if we're not able to, as a cabinet or as a state, match some of those grants that are being awarded. And I'm speaking specifically more non-highway modes, but your river ports, your rail, uh, freight movers across across the Commonwealth. So if there was some type of federal freight fund that we could utilize when we're partnering to going after and bringing those federal dollars to Kentucky, I think that would be a significant asset to have and make us much more competitive when we go after those federal dollars to support the multimodal transportation network in Kentucky. And then again, mentioning the the freight rail and safety improvement program, having that preservation and maintenance component to it for some of the short line and regional railroads, but also the industrial access and, and capital expenditures when it comes to economic development as a way for us to continue to retract new, or attract new business, but also retain those existing customers that we have here in Kentucky. So we appreciate the opportunity to be here and happy to answer any questions. Representative Tackett Lafferty. I'll try to keep this short because I I think this is our last presentation, correct? Um, I just wanted to, um, to ask, um, many, many of you know I've been married for 20 years to a fellow who's been working on the railroad for over 25 years. So um, I'm very familiar with, with uh, uh, our railways. Um, what I ask frequently is, is there a railroad spur? we need a railroad spur for economic development. So it sounds like rail is a very attractive thing um, when you're talking about bringing in economic development. So I heard you earlier say that you're having to reinvent yourself and, um, you know, that you're working with locals in order to try to develop um, economically. So how can we encourage these businesses? I mean, do, do the private railways work with businesses in order to to bring in um, jobs to locations such as rail spurs 
I mean, I, I've not had a lot of luck. Obviously, in eastern Kentucky, we haul mostly coal. So a lot of times we, we ship the coal from our Pikeville yard to Ashland where they put them on the barges, things of that nature. Um, so, but, it, but it's been very difficult when I have people who ship steel and things of that nature asking, well, do you have a railroad spur? Because I'm not sure how we get the railroads to work with these companies to transport their goods. How do we make that connection for you and for the community, I guess is what I'm asking. Um, speaking for the class one or specifically for Norfolk Southern. So we have a, um, an industrial development department um, and we have a gentleman that covers Kentucky and, and Tennessee. And then we have a marketing department. And generally speaking, I mean, um, we're, we're knowledgeable about our customer base. So we, we kind of have pre-existing relationships with, you know, if it's an ADM or a Toyota or somebody like that, larger customers, we have a pre-existing relationship. You know, we, we do have 322 unique customers in Kentucky alone. Um, but that's a long way of saying you would, if it's a smaller customer, they're shipping a couple of rail cars a week or something like that, you would get in contact with our industrial development department um, or our marketing department, and we could, we could work on facilitating a conversation about how to, how to get a rail spur or if rail service is possible. And just to piggyback on that to your question, yes, we as rail operators do are brought into the conversation with the economic development cabinet or local economic developers when they're looking to attract a, a new industry. If rail is required, a lot of folks like to have rail as an option. Quite frankly, it helps make things more competitive from a freight movement if, if rail is offered. Um, so we do work with uh, the, the, both the local and the state when it comes to attracting new business. And if there are opportunities for existing business or or new that need rail but aren't directly related to a rail spur, that transloading type option is where can we find the nearest facility or nearest transload to reduce that truck haul that we can actually ship their go their goods and um, product via rail to a facility and then truck it those last few miles versus actually trucking several hundred miles from somewhere else to help make that more cost effective for the end user. Thank you very much. Co-chair Hal. Thank you, Madam Chair. I've got as much a comment as a question. I want to thank both of you for coming today. Sorry that y'all got stuck at the end of this. This was really informative and it, it raised a lot more questions for me than I even realized I had. So I'll probably connect offline with you sometime on that. If Please do. Okay. But I just wanted to make this comment. I, I really appreciate the fact that you came to this meeting with issues that we could actually identify and address about where we are, where we're not, where other people are that we that we aren't to get to the so what port portion of of this task force <clears throat> to actually identify the space that we could we could look at getting into that that could create some real benefit for the commonwealth so i just want to thank you for for putting this together this way and bring this information this way thanks thank you again for the opportunity and i'm going to ask you Representative Please. Smith yeah uh, I kind of want to back up what the senator said. Thank you for what you do for Kentucky and for your investments you put in Kentucky. Um, as we speak, we've got a feasibility study going on at CSX and Corbin uh, where they closed down several years ago. So it's looking at what you described for the last half hour on the intermobile uh, transport. And so we've got that feasibility study going for the region. And uh, hopefully we'll have that. I told uh, Chairman Howe that uh, we want to have a deadline, and we're hoping it's so we can have them come and present it to the meet to our task force. But in saying that, I, I've listened to ports issues, and uh, we need to do something about that financially. Uh, they've been uh, we've been shown that we're behind the eight ball for years, and on our growth in our ports, and the future, I think, in our area, Eastern Kentucky, is the rail. And so any way that you can help us with identifying anything, you, you have the knowledge, you have the understanding. As you said, she was reaching out for a spur. You know, those are important. And we've got those infrastructures in the east that have are just sitting there, dormant, uh, that can be used. So anything that you can help us with in the future that – we all need to be a partner in this. So uh, uh, thank you for your testimony today. 
Thank you again, and we look forward to continuing to partner in with the state to provide solutions for our multimodal transportation network. Thank you, Representative Smith. Thank you both for presenting today. There's one thing I'd like to ask of you all to um, submit us information. I won't ask you to explain it today, but um, I know you said that there's a feasibility study that is being worked on that should be due in 24. Um, but also, rail is different than our ports and our airports and all that. Rail is treated differently at the federal level. At the, you know, it's just structured different. So if you have an opportunity to kind of provide information to our staff so that we can send that out to our members so that they understand how you all are, are structured differently so that we can kind of, I think that it would be helpful to the committee to be aware um, I know a little bit of it, but I know a, enough of it just to be dangerous. And it would be helpful if you all would pro provide that information so that whenever we're looking at everything that we're looking at for this report um, to bring back to the House and Senate that we can have that information so that we can educate our members. Yeah, absolutely. And we are... We don't fall under workers' comp state workers' compensation laws. Um, you know, we're on railroad retirement. Um, so, from a human resources standpoint, um, what our biggest difference between the ports and the airports is that you know we're privately owned. We're traded, you know, publicly traded company, and so. But yeah, we're happy to provide that information. So, and, and Representative Co-Chair uh, Co Miles, um, just as a, also very broad, you know, the railroads are federally regulated, so they're federally regulated uh, on the safety side through the Federal Rail Administration. So that's our regulatory agency on, on safety and compliance. And then on the commerce side, we have the Surface Transportation Board, which is the formerly the Interstate Commerce Commission. And so the STB regulates all economic activity at the federal level. So if you think of it, you've got two main regulatory agencies that oversee the rail industry both at the federal level well I think it would just be kind of helpful for us to know that because it's kind of like I think all of us would like to have more of the interchanges you know we would like to see those trains stop and load and unload a little bit more in our communities and and we don't see that as much as we probably would like for it to and we understand that's a business decision but we also we do the structure is different so you all do need to be treated differently because of, of the rules that you all have to abide by from the federal standpoint so if you could get us some of that information i think would be valuable for our members but we Absolutely. want to thank all of you all and 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 all the presentations have been amazing today um, i'm sorry we've lost some members along the way it's been a very long day of committee meetings i know for several people but um, the information is very valuable and so i want to thank you both for for joining us and all the presenters today is there any other questions or business of the committee well, then if there's no objections, we are adjourned.